So you had this sense that you were absolutely nobody of any importance, but you were part of some great big global thing. Oneness for most philosophers was defined in terms of what made human subjects distinctive and different from other subjects, uh, and therefore made us one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of our speaker series, The New Discourse on Oneness, sponsored by the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, the Rock Ethics Institute at Pennsylvania State University, and the Center on Modernity in Transition. I'm Sharzad Sabet. I'm a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU and co-director of the Center on Modernity in Transition. And I'm Benjamin Shul, and together with Sharzad, I direct Comet. The idea of oneness has emerged as an important concept within a growing number of scholarly debates. This series brings together a diverse group of leading thinkers to explore notions of oneness and to consider their implications for some of the most pressing social and ethical questions we face today. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Akhil Bilgrami and Mary Louise Pratt to discuss Imagining Global Futures. Mary Louise Pratt is Silver Professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University. Her books include Imperial Eyes, Travel Writing and Transculturation, and Planetary Longings. Akhil Bilgrami is Sidney Morgan Besser Professor of Philosophy at Columbia University. He is the author of Self-Knowledge and Resentment and Secularism, Identity, and Enchantment. Akhil, Mary Louise, a very warm welcome to you both. Welcome. So as many of our, our audience members know, we like to begin these conversations on a more personal and biographical note. So before we dive in, could you tell us a little bit about how your personal, intellectual, even spiritual journeys have led you to think and write about the horizons of global imagination? Mary Louise, let's start with you. Well, this was a very interesting question for me to think about um, because I grew up in English Canada in the 1950s and spent the 1970s, from the 1970s on, I made my academic career in the United States and spent that time, much of that time studying Latin America. So Really, empire and colonialism have been part of my both my personal and intellectual uh, existence in a very continuous way. And growing up in a in a small town, rural town in a white settler colony, which was in Ontario in Canada, um, of the British Empire, which became the British Commonwealth. Um, there was you what you learned was first of all that you were not important and you learned that everything around you everything important happened elsewhere and nothing around you really had any real significance or value in the world in the larger world but at the same time and i'm i'm really intrigued to hear if akil share this experience at the same time you were educated to see yourself as part of this huge global enterprise. And so we were, when I thought about this question, I remembered that, you know, in school, every fall when you went into your new grade, you were given the two things, an atlas with an, with an atlas, of course, and every, in every school with the maps on the wall with the British, the British countries in red, and you're given an atlas and geography was extremely important part of your education. And in the U.S., that was not true. Geography wasn't taught. You were given a, an atlas and you're given a ruler. And on the back of the ruler were listed all the kings and queens of England, the rulers. Right. So it was a pun on rulers. And you were supposed to memorize those. And so you you got you got the sense like the lives around you didn't matter 
except when England, Britain went to war and everybody went to fight. And that was a heroic narrative that people were very proud to be part of and proud to sacrifice their lives for. The other thing that was important in our schooling was, was languages. And I, in my, in my little rural town of 3,000 people, got to study Latin, German, and French for years in school and ended up going into modern, modern languages and comparative literature. So you, you, you really had, had this, and your town was full of, the women from the town were, there was full of people who'd been missionaries, who taught in Africa, who'd fought in wars, who'd been abroad along these lines of imperial mobility. So you had this sense that you were absolutely nobody of any importance, but you were part of some great big global thing. So that was I, I've I've come back to that now as you as you uh, give the, put this question to us, but then in the seventies I moved to the United States at a time when the university was possessed by the and student politics were possessed by the fight against U.S. imperialism and there was all the anti war Vietnam anti war movement Central America and. And especially if you were part of um, anything that was third world studies, the idea of the third world was already this anti-imperial idea that was making its way in the university as a as a space of knowledge making. And we were surrounded by these very powerful th- theories that were global in reach, world systems theory and dependency theory and and um, and and struggles that were going on for Latin Americans. It was the Cuban Revolution, the national liberation struggles, African decolonization, and all these writers. You know, Walter Rodney, Fanon, Glissant, C. L. R. James, Samir Amin, writing in a global, often Marxist way, paradigm. Um, and that was very uh, also for a generational kind of phenomenon that I was part of. And then, of course, my generation also in the 80s and 90s experienced globalization, meaning this the, the whole project of neoliberal capitalism, who had it, who, who, which worked with an idea of oneness, which was a oneness of a market, you know, and, um, and a system uh, of, of um, capitalist production, consumption, extraction. And we watched, you know, in a way, it was a horrible period watching all the aspir- revolutionary aspirations for world revolution get demolished and this system producing a, a vast amounts of misery and, 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 and inequality. But again, it, 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 it imagined itself on a global scale and we had to theorize it um, on a global scale, even while you're studying it locally. So there were all these ways... <laughs> There are all these ways in which a global imagination began for me, like literally in the first grade, in grade one with the atlas. And it just kept unfolding as as part of as in my intellectual formation. So thank you. Thank you. I haven't even mentioned world literature, which is the other thing that neoliberal. Well, well, you you may if you would like to bring that in. No, that's okay. (laughs) Oh, wait. Okay. Um, Akil, I'm, I'm eager to hear how you would answer the question. Right. Um, you know, my, my my background and experience is is uh, really very similar to the kind of thing that Mary was just describing. I grew up in in Bombay, what was then called Bombay, and uh, and you know, we my father, uh, who was an intellectual, he was a judge, but very widely read, uh, would often say that if if what the, one of the results of of imperial of of our colonization in India was that British history was our history, so we were immediately linked to the history of the colonizer, and and then as Mary said, we all grew up and I grew up in the late I was in college in the late sixties, and all these uh, theories which which linked different. Uh, anti-colonial movements and and tried to understand the survival of colonialism in new forms after independence uh, uh, linked the countries of the south together. In fact, Andhra Gunda Frank came and visited uh, uh, India. I remember uh, talking to him as a kid. He was uh, very nice to me. And in fact, 
uh, he read some article by me and Gandhi, um, uh, you know, about 20 years or so ago. I got a, just before I, he died, I think I got a, a very sweet note from him uh, setting me straight on on, uh, on on what he thought was wrong with my essay, but in the nicest way. And uh, and so I, I had these uh, political sorts of, of global reach that just the sort of thing that Mary was describing because of our common uh, uh, origins in colonized lands. But, you know, in my case, there was this, I, I gravitated to philosophy in my college years in Bombay, and then of course uh, went on to do it uh, in England. And I think that a very different angle on, on oneness came from, as a philosopher, uh, looking at everybody else who was thinking philosophically as I grew into the subject, that oneness for most philosophers was defined in terms of what made human subjects distinctive and different from other subjects, uh, and therefore made us one, right? So, so oneness of human subjects was defined by our distinctiveness uh, when compared to other creatures, other, uh, and that's how philosophers have always done it. So the, the notion of reason right from very early times was seen as what united, what, what made us distinctive and therefore made us one. Uh, always by contrast to those who lacked reason. And, or language. <laughs> uh, or language. Or language. Right. Um, or, or, uh, and so, you know, I, I began to, to think very much hard about what is reason and can one, can one think of reason without, without reifying it into some idea with a capital R, you know, with the, that are there low profile notions of, of reason that we possess, which, which is not possessed by say frogs and dogs, uh, to say nothing of trees and so on. Um, and I worked very hard on that myself. Uh, is, there, is there a notion of reason? Is there a notion of, of autonomy that human subjects have, which, which can be studied in a lower profile so that on the one hand, they didn't lead to some kind of invidious speciesism, and on the other, that they didn't get reified so that some could claim that they possess reason and others didn't, which is what really happened with imperialism uh, when, when slaves were said to not possess reason or native uh, indigenous uh, uh, communities were said, or, uh, and that was very much imperialism's trajectory. So, so was there a notion of reason where that could not be said? Very, uh, yeah. So these were the issues that, that can, confronted me as a philosopher when I was thinking of what made human subjects uh, distinctive and claims to our oneness on the basis of that distinctiveness. You look very um, interesting and thought-provoking answers. Um, and Akhil, you've already led us quite naturally into the next question we were hoping to discuss, which is the concept of oneness itself, which lies at the heart of the speaker series. So the term oneness resonates with a number of other terms or ideas that both of you in your scholarship have engaged, often critically. Terms like the global, for example, um, or the human or reason. So one of the reasons why we're exploring the term oneness in this series is to try to open up and suggest new horizons of conceptual possibility at a moment when the recognition of our planetary interdependence and our shared humanity seems urgent and necessary. So in that light, and given the limits of concepts such as global, cosmopolitanism, humanism, how might you suggest that we draw upon Think about the concept of oneness as we look ahead to our collective future. So, Akhil, you know, perhaps you could start and, and 
continue to unfold some of the thoughts you were you were just presenting. Right. Um, well, you know, one of the the really difficult things is that we live in a time which is very different from the 30 or so year period after the Second World War. Uh, and what the time we live in, which as which it very pointed out, has come to be called neoliberalism. I think one way to ask, or one way to explore what you're asking us to explore might be to think about what's distinctive about neoliberalism, but compare it to the period just before. That is, what is it that neoliberalism overthrew? And I think you have to understand that what it overthrew was, however defective and however faltering and faltering it was, the period after the Second World War had made some, the nature of capital was, there was an attempt all over the world to constrain capital along lines that were broadly first theorized by Keynes uh, to generate uh, ideas of, of social democracy, welfare, and so on. And in our time, uh, in the, the neoliberal period grew as out of a repudiation of those constraints on capital, uh, which were really done in the name of oneness. That is, uh, when the Bretton Woods, when the Bretton Woods institutions were dismantled or remantled, and a lot of the Keynesian uh, 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 sort of efforts at demand management and, and so on were undermined by by uh, undermining an institution or, or re refurbishing uh, an instant uh, re uh, orienting an, an, an sort of institutions called Bretton Woods that Keynes himself had had uh, played a major role in in constructing what I think a certain kind of oneness emerged which was the runaway capacity for capital to move that is a kind of runaway capital mobility that emerged um, through the remantling of the of the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, capital got financialized and globalized. And so that was the real path to oneness of a very specific kind. And, and so in a way, once you acknowledge that, some of the struggles we have in trying to understand how to think about oneness is, are there ways of countering that oneness and what kinds of imagination one needs to construct a different kind and and what would that be makes things very hard indeed but i think we have to acknowledge that a wrong form of oneness emerged through the financialization of capital and the capacity of capital to move at the press of a button uh anywhere in the world and so one world was created in in that sense and an and obviously unhappy sense because it's what generates neoliberalism. And uh, and the consequences of neoliberalism well, are well known to many people and we can talk about it certainly, but I just wanted to register that that any, any um, fruitful exploration of the notion of oneness should recognize that that kind of oneness was is the oneness of our period, which I think we have to resist. Um, and it may require another kind of oneness, but all that requires a lot of thought. Yeah. Mary Louise, how, how might you answer this question? Um, well, I, you know, just to follow up on what Akil was saying, I was fascinated by a book that appeared in the 1990s that took up, I agree with your, your analysis is exactly the one that I have of neoliberalism. 
and then two feminist political economists, uh, Julie Graham and, and uh, K- Catherine Gibson, wrote a book called The End of Capitalism, parenthesis, as we knew it, parenthesis. And they make an argument that within the oneness of capitalism, capitalist societies or economies, capitalist economies only work, if you look at them, they only work because they are full of non-capitalist relationships, relations of labor and labor practices. And so you have the capitalism only works because it doesn't monopolize. It it requires all kinds of unpaid labor, enslaved labor, prison labor, theft, um, you know, all kinds of um, non-capitalist forms of production in order to to maintain to maintain themselves. So I found that a very interesting. Uh, antidote to the sense that we had of just this monopolization of everything and the with the end of the the really serious resistance movement and uh so and and but it's a book that every time I have introduced it in a seminar of colleagues to read everyone reacts very violently to it <laughs> and I find it fascinating kind of very persuasive they wrote a second book called post capitalist politics but for me, with oneness, I have to say that the, uh, and I'm almost relieved that you say we have that our notion of one. There's a notion of oneness that has to be resisted because, at this point, and again, I'm thinking about fu- futures. I, I, the the idea of the oneness of humanity is not is not an idea that I that for me generates helpful possibilities for alternative futures or for doing things otherwise, um, uh, or the idea of planetary interdependence, either as conditions to be recognized, as you describe them, or as ideals to be realized. I, In other words, I don't, I see the world very much in terms of radical heterogeneity and singularity, even though it's true that you can buy ivory soap in almost every city in the world. But um, I don't see the that kind of oneness of humanity as a desideratum that will respond to um, the, the imperatives that we face, uh, which for me are the imperatives brought about particularly by, by climate change. And it may be that that's the, the difference that um, now I'm using, I think for me, I'm thinking of oneness as a concept in the sense that um, Elizabeth Gross uses in um, Becoming Undone. She's an Australian feminist philosopher, and she has a whole section on new, the making of new knowledges in which she says, she she picks up on Deleuze and Guattari and says, concepts only come into being in relation to specific problems. And they do not offer solutions to problems. They offer they are they are a device that enables the search for solutions. And this, she says, <clears throat> or for imagining solutions, she says concepts emerge, have value and function only through the impact of problems generated from through their impact of problems generated from outside. So I was trying to figure out what problem generated the the desire for one, what problem, what the oneness of humanity will solve, right? What is the problem that brought that up for all of you? And what uh, what kind of solution does it um, enable you to imagine? The job um, of concept, she says, is to open up alternatives to the present by enabling um, the imagining of possibilities for being otherwise and imagining possibilities for humanity to be more inter more have a greater sense of oneness um i don't i'm just not sure exactly what um what problem that solves for us and that this it may be because i'm just not understanding um the the premise she says they are essential to the work of thinking our way in a world of forces that we do not control. Um, so, but I think seeing the world in terms of radical heterogeneity 
and singularity or and seeing it in terms of violence and cruelty and and injustice is kind of the lot of anybody who spends their life like me thinking about colonialism and an empire um and I, of course putting an end to violence and injustice is a desirable thing but i i want it, i i need to figure out how a concept of oneness of humanity would get us there or any other concept of oneness but at the same time i have another concept of oneness that comes to mind because when you study empire it brings you into contact with all kinds of um peoples who are not part of the western humanist paradigm and I've spent a lot of my a lot of my life studying and reading about um, the indigenous peoples of the Andes in Peru and Bolivia. And I'm just rereading a brilliant book by Marisol de la Cadena. It's called Earth Beings: Ecology of Practice Across Andean Worlds. And she studies in this book the intellectual and cosmological um, traditions of a particular. Andean community, a very remote Andean community with a long, long continuity that traces its continuity back to the Inca Empire and knows all that. And in this community, the, the idea of a common humanity would be very alien. And they've spent 500 years fighting off fighting colonial colonialism in all its mutations. But so their relations with others are trans other humans are transactional. But they have a very powerful idea of oneness, which is that's shared by many indigenous groups in the world. It's the oneness of the place that they're part of. Their, their oneness with all the entities that make up that place and all the entities or the existing things that make up that place. And that, that general oneness includes not just animals and plants, but also all the, all the geographical features, the caves, the lagoons, the mountains, the, um, the rivers, the rock formations. All these are called earth beings. That's the title of the book. And all these things are understood to exercise agency in that place and to have responsibility there. So all the, the exi things existing that make the place have relations of mutual care and accountability and responsibility and so it, it's not that any it's it's not that you live in a place it's that you are the place and everything there is the place it's not a thing that happens to be in that place it is the place and i'm sure this is not unfamiliar um to all of you but that that kind of idea of oneness of course produces a very different world from capitalism and Western modernity. Um, and it produces very different forms of community, of production, of justice, um, of um, governance. And those models are all very highly developed because these are old, old, old um, communities. Um, so that idea of oneness connected in that way with with in which a human and the non-human and what we would think of as a human and the non-human are just all entities, many entities of many different forms of being totally tied together. And so that none, nothing could be removed from there and belong anywhere else. And you, you don't have to be Andean to experience a sense of incredible rootedness and entanglement in a place. That experience again is everywhere. It, it's everywhere you go, you will find people who are who feel who experience what their place like in that way. Um, and we just they they're just that that experience has never been hegemonic in modernity because in modernity the the norm for agency and is is mobility, right? And modernity prizes mobility, and uh, in 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 many many ways. And so I was thinking if you re, uh, this example let, leads toward an idea of rethinking, uh, w uh, rethinking um, mobility in terms of embeddedness in uh, rethinking, rethinking oneness in terms of the mm -hmm. human interconnection with, the, with uh, everything else, but in a placed way. 
And it would pick up on those traditions of placidness that are very powerful in everywhere. I mean, look, New Yorkers, <laughs> there are so many New Yorkers who people will tell you everywhere you go, I could never live anywhere else. You know, and so that that's a different a different paradigm that to me um, that you could start drawing on those traditions of placidness. And uh, many ecological thinkers are, are thinking in this way. And I'm just kind of intrigued by that as the kind of alternative future, because the, the question's a little bit. Your question, I think, might be a little bit. What's the grand narrative going to be? What's the big story that we're going to live that we want to live? You have to want to to live it. So. So anyway, that was sort of my uncomfortable take on the oneness of humanity. <laughs> I'm I'm so I'm so glad you got to where you did because I think precisely our motivation in in having the series and posing the question is to open up the possibility of different paradigms that transcend the limits, often oppressive limits, of how these ideas have been conceptualized, you know, in the past or in our present. Um Maybe we can turn to um, two of the other ideas that that appear in the title of this session, imagination and the future. The importance of imagination figures in both your work, especially in relation to the future. And, and here, Mary Louise, I'll go to you first. Your book, Planetary Longings, is directly concerned with what you call the crisis of futurity. Could you tell us more about that crisis and about the role that imagination plays in addressing it? Okay. Well, first of all, the, fu the future is always imagined. <laughs> if you say, I will be there tomorrow, you are not making a statement of fact, a truth claim. You cannot. It, it can be a promise, a commitment, an expectation, um, or a lie. <laughs> but it can't be a truth claim. And so the future, you know, future tenses and grammars and are always imagined about imagined scenarios and very often sub and subjunctives exist in a lot of grammatical systems to precisely mark that, that point. Um, so in planetary longings, I argue that the new millennium kind of inaugurates a crisis of futurity. Um, and also connected to a sense of planetarity. So it's like, I, I, I argue that there's a kind of a shift that's just really a pivot right at the end of the 20th century, where we move in, in academy, we move from thinking about the post, where the 90s are the decade of the post everything. We flip to geo, the geo-linguistic, the geo-humanities, geo-historical, and we flip from that that post backward looking reanalysis of modernity of of the of the grand narratives of the past towards a perplexity about what can be the grand narrative of the future and the reason for that is uh is planetary it is that the pivot is the point at which when we switch to look at the future we're looking at radical uncertainty, radical unpredictability, a crisis in knowledge and knowledge making because our our knowledge making mechanisms are and norms are begin to fail us because you can't the the future can no longer be derived from the the present or the past in so many areas. And so I talk about this sort of and my my sort of favorite tiny, small scale, but well, not trivial, non-trivial example of that was that it went, was the Y2K crisis. And you, I don't know if, if it, you two were around for that, but there was the point when, when we were in, in the 90, late nineties, we were terrified that when the millennium hit and the year 2000, be, the, the millennium 2000 began, all the computers would stop because there was, they wouldn't be able to change the date. And we literally thought this would happen. There was a tremendous amount of concern and fear and an enormous amount of huge investment was made all over the world to including one of my best friends spent years trying to fix to fi fixing the Y2K problem mm -hmm. on a network of companies for a, 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 that she worked for. 
the Y2K problem seemed to me like it was like the little, the small thing that inaugurated the crisis of futurity. We are totally uncertain. And when it indeed, when it happened on January 1st, 2000, none of us knew, nobody knew what was going to happen. And we entered this uncertainty and it turned out nothing happened. The solutions worked. Um, so there was just a whole set of, of markers that that flipped us from, from uh, post to geo and from and, and futurity um, around that point. And so I, that was sort of my, my um, vision of, of, of the crisis of futurity. And I think um, one of the big, and as I say, it's overwhelmingly a crisis of knowledge and knowledge making because what we find increasingly now actually is, you know, Science can't operate the way it did before because its gold standard of the replicability of repli predictability and replicability no longer will hold. I mean, things it, it, things change so quickly and so, are likely to change so fast that you can't be sure that last year's experiment can be replicated this year with the same result. And so science has a kind of crisis of normativity that we saw really play itself out during the um, pandemic, you know, where science kept, we were kept, we were kept, people kept being told by the state, pay attention to the science, but the science kept having to revise itself. It kept being wrong because it did, we'd never had this before, didn't know. And so, and statistics will fail you now because statistics are just the past predicting the future. And they no longer do that very, you know, with 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 reliable accuracy. So there's all this um, drama of unpredictability and on and uncertainty and risk. And no, the, the certainty is that we know we can't predict what's going to happen. We know the certainty is there was going there's going to be radical change, but we have no idea of what it is or very little idea of what it is. So I find that, and it, I find that just fascinating. I think this is like, I mean, we all feel apocalyptic in a way, but it's also a, a totally amazing, exhilarating time to be a knowledge maker or an artist, you know, because you're just, uh, things open up all the time to, to really kind of speculative, creative thought because um, the par the paradigms are all destabilized. So I I sort of think if you're a knowledge maker, it's a great time um, to, or, or an artist. It's a very creative ex moment and quite exciting. And in the humanities, you know, the demand is to redefine the object of study it, that you the uh, the knowledge makers in what we've called the human sciences. We have to learn. We have to overthrow the paradigm that Akil was talking about, about the the superior the the human the oneness of the human in its superiority over everything else because the because the whole the whole thing is it's is we are required to grasp the human is required to grasp itself in its relationality and in its embeddedness um in everything else and in its interdependencies as you're talking about so um for me the the crisis of futurity is also a moment of pretty exciting you know um possibility possibilities and and an invitation to take risks be wrong learn from them because you know you're going to be wrong you know you're not going to be right so um that's sort of my 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 uh existential uh, portrait of the moment <laughs> the future right. Akil, how, how do you see well how do you see all of this and and in particular um the role of imagination in navigating the various crises that we face and how we might go about cultivating new capacities for imagination. I think some of what Mary Louise is describing, whether individually or collectively. Yeah, uh, well, I like, uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, Mary Louise's stress on place-based uh, responses to the wrong kind of oneness that that neoliberalism has brought through this changing nature of, of finance capital. Um, you see, part of the problem is that uh, 
the initial reactions by by theorists, uh, literary people, political economists, and so on, to this this form of oneness that that needs resistance that came with neoliberalism was to think that we could have a form of resistance that was global itself a sort of you know uh had its own kind of oneness at the level of resistance i'm very skeptical of that i don't believe there is any real scope for global solidarities uh you know this idea that Hart and Negri had that there would be this multitude rising, which which would be, I have no idea what they meant. It's completely un, undefined by them. It's a kind of fantasy that that to match global capital, they would finance capital, there would be a multitude which would be international or global. Uh, that's just, I, I have no idea what they're talking about. It, it was completely unspecified by them what this idea of a multitude was. And I don't see any chance that that the peasantry in the farmers in India are going to show global solidarity with, leave alone Mexican workers, you know, uh, uh, people in China or n- nearby. Um, after all, Podemos didn't support Syria when when the bankers in Brussels and and Germany were were you know uh, throwing their weight around with Greece. So it's there's there's very little scope for resistance at the global level to capital at the global level as it has become. So so I'm I'm very sympathetic to the idea that if there is going to be resistance, it's going to be place based rather than international solidarities and and i think one needs the imagination to to pursue that and and i will i, I haven't read the work by these two authors that that uh, mary mentioned but it seems to me obviously right uh, in in some sense and to link it with futurity which you see one of the things we we must understand is that the left, when when Mary and I, at the time when Mary and I were growing up, never, they taught honorably and worked very hard to, to make urgent the problem of global injustice. But it was never on the horizon of the left to talk of future generations. Future generations were not something that concerned the left at all. So climate issues never really emerged because future generations was not ever concerned of the left. Uh, global injustice was a, a concern of the left. So uh, of the left. So so one of the things we we need to to now that we've got such existential concerns about climate change, I think futurity is obviously present with with uh, with the uh, notion of of the world for the future generations and the world in the future uh, the earth uh, planet earth in the future and it's you know but you can't you can't deal you can't delink that from questions of capital uh, because you know i think Naomi Klein is right you the idea that you can even address the 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 climate crisis uh, without really seeking to undermine capital in very fundamental ways is just hopeless. Uh, in fact, if you remember in Copenhagen, there were about you know 20 people sitting in a room uh, discussing climate issues, 20, maybe 40 people sitting at most uh, in the Copenhagen meeting and Morales just took the Latin American contingent away. He said, listen, I haven't heard the word capitalism mentioned once in these meetings. I'm just leaving. And they walked out of of the uh, Copenhagen meeting. And he went back uh, and and he had in Bolivia uh, a meeting, uh, 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 a climate summit in which there may have been 40 people. There were 400 people, maybe over a thousand people, I'm forgetting the numbers now, but uh, who came to the climate summit that he had organized. So, so, and and all these came from indigenous ideas and indigenous epistemologies, and uh, and and I think Bolivia was in a particularly 
uh, effective position because it was the first place, so far as I know, uh, in which a, uh, an indigenous uh, group were in power, you know, in power in the modern state, uh, 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 possession of the modern state. Uh, and and so it's very interesting to look at these indigenous epistemologies, as, as Mary has been uh, doing in in uh, in her work, and and I think uh, one of the things that 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 they've managed to do it's sort of interesting because you know um, uh, Bolivia talks of nature's rights, so it has been forced to use the vocabulary of rights, a, a very modern vocabulary. Uh, it, it's not it's not indigenous vocabulary to talk of rights, but uh, and. And I suppose it's inevitable that he, that they would have to do that. But you see, one of the the philosophical things that that we have to do is to is to recognize that the way in which we are distinctive through the position of a notion of reason which is not invidious, right? Which is uh, which doesn't self congratulate uh, uh, human. Uh, beings on possessing it, but sees it sees us sees ourselves as special because in possessing reason of a certain kind, a capacity for self criticism, a capacity to ask uh, something that wolves don't ask. You see, wolves, being pack animals, don't ask, "Should I be doing what the pack is doing?" They can't ask that, whereas you and I can ask that. The very fact that we can ask that makes us distinct. And I, if you, I mean, I don't think there's any denying that we are distinct in that sense, that we are not pack animals and can ask this question, should we be doing what, what everybody's doing, what the pack is doing? Even though we are social creatures, we can ask this question in a way that wolves can't say. Um, and, and so, so the point is, what lesson do we learn from our from the distinctive possession of this capacity? And I think the answer is that it gives us greater responsibility. That's the non-self-congratulatory answer to, to saying that we are possessed of this distinctive thing, that it gives us a sense of responsibility, and that sense of responsibility, if one is to explore the kinds of things Mary uh, Mary's remarks were directing us to that. That has to point out that that even though we are distinct, there is a real sense in which we are animals too, and that we are living things too, like other things. So we have we have fellow creatures. That is, animals are fellow creatures, and so is a range of other natural things. And so, so on the one hand, we may be distinct, but on the other hand, we are nevertheless, our, uh, the other foot, as it were, is deeply planted in the animal world, in the living world. Um, and, and that makes us common with, with a whole range of other things. And our responsibility requires us to include all of that in the political representation that we have generated through ideas of politics, representation of interests, representations of, of uh, uh, well-being, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so it, and I would say, I would go further than just talk of living things. It seems to me if you really push this through along indigenous lines, um, what we need to do is even question the kinds of things we've allowed to develop that that develop a culture of obsolescence, um, of planned obsolescence about things, leave alone creatures and living things. Um, I mean, I think I think the what the indigenous ideas present us with. If we are to push it further through with a sense of responsibility that uh, I think we alone as, as creatures possess, we would be asking, should anything be be destroyed if it's not doing harm? Anything. This this little thing here, right here. This little thing. 
why should it why should we get rid of it if it's not doing harm uh, the culture of obsolescence comes because one has the idea that well if something if something more useful more utilitarian comes along just junk the old thing and and go for the new thing and i i think what the indigenous epistemology is teaching us is no there's nothing compulsory about that ideal of, of, of obsolescence. If it's not doing harm, don't let it go. Uh, don't go for the next new thing. Um, and, and I think all this just simply follows if we, if we, with a sense of responsibility, pursue some of these uh, uh, notions that, that Mary uh, says is illuminatingly found in indigenous epistemologies. I just wanted to add one little thing to your, I'm so happy you brought up the multitude, the image of the multitude that, that didn't materialize because in a way it materialized as my as the desperate migrant stream, right? Because so that transnational mob or multi, not mob, multitude is at the border, is at the borders, you know, at the Mediterranean and at the and on the, on the Rio Grande. It's it's everyone from everywhere. <laughs> well, so in this last question, you've both been you know, helped us think about um, the necessity for place based thinking, the possible contributions of indigenous thought, um, some of the limitations of you know expectations about some kind of organically emerging global multitude that would resist the unjust forms of, of globalization that have been characterizing the past decades. Um, but then at the same time, you know, there are places of generative creativity um, that one can observe within this shifting, interconnected, interacting global horizon. And so in your own research, you both discuss these contact zones, and to use you know, Mary Louise's term, where disparate cultures meet, clash, grapple with each other, often in asymmetrical power relations, such as those created by colonialism and its aftermath. Um, but there are also, they borrow, they, they, they intermingle, they derive you know, mutual inspiration and influence. And so one product of these contexts has been new expanded consciousness of human connection, whether for the purpose of conquest or in waking wider forms of solidarity or a sense of, of, of commonality or connection. So, you know, one might think here about Gandhi's engagement with British colonial law and Christian thought across these contact zones in South Africa and India. They shaped his novel visions of colonialism. They also shaped his novel visions of new horizons and possibility for human solidarity um, and, and oneness. So Akio, you know, knowing that you have done some work on Gandhi and, and from what I understand are, are doing a more elaborate and significant work on Gandhi right now, how might Gandhi's anti-colonial engagement with these contact zones, um, how might it have contributed to a, a genuinely planetary form of consciousness? And how might this kind of Gandhian or post-Gandhian style of planetary consciousness differ from the modern secular capitalist forms of global thought that, that we've just been discussing. Right. Um, see, one way to, to understand Gandhi is that he was resisting um, a conception of what made us one and trying to offer an alternative. Uh, what he was resisting was the idea that countries of the South, uh, countries uh, that Mary has been studying, countries um, in Africa and Asia, um, that, that there's a general view that is shared not just by modernization theorists, but by Marxists. Uh, uh, so if you look at Marx's notion of primitive accumulation, uh, Marx's idea was um, that old forms of denial of oneness in terms of, of tribes and castes and religious schisms and so on, what he called primordial uh, identities and primordial uh, uh, group thinking, um, 
he thought would be overcome by what he called primitive accumulation, that is, dispossession of the people at the sites of these hierarchies and and um, ident you know local uh, parochial uh, identities, dispossession of them from their means of production, so peasants from their land and artisans from their um, local cottage industries. Uh, and morphing them into, into cities, you know, the great cities, London's and Manchester's that he wrote, wrote about, uh, through the advances of, of capital, uh, which of course he, he wanted to eventually overcome, but he nevertheless thought that it was an important incubation uh, in order to to bring people together and make the only division that was a threat to oneness, one of class. Uh, so all these primordial uh, uh, divisions uh, would be gone and it, uh, they would morph into uh, a single uh, new form of community, which would be uh, working people, uh, labor, uh, industrial labor. And, um, and he, he had this idea that all forms of dividing human subjects would be overcome by this uh, primitive accumulation process. Uh, and Gandhi just denied it. He said, it is simply not available to countries of the South for a very simple reason. Uh, and that is that he said, where, and I mean, he didn't say this, but you can, draw the inference, and in my work, I've, I've, I've tried to draw this inference from his writing. He imagine the following counterfactual scenario. Imagine all the people dispossessed by, by this process that Marx calls primitive accumulation to create the great Londons and Manchesters and other great uh, manufacturing towns of Europe. So imagine if those people who'd been dispossessed by this process uh, of primitive accumulation, did not migrate to other parts of the temperate belt, to the America, to, to North America, Canada, America, the Antipodes, the southern corners of Africa. This is where people who were dispossessed in Europe went. He says, now imagine, so I'm, I'm saying, imagine a scenario when they remained sedentary and didn't go to other parts of the world. This is a counterfactual. Counter to fact, let's say they stayed in Europe. Well, what reason is there to think that those primordial hierarchies and divisions of society would be overcome? The only reason why they were overcome is because massive numbers of peasants move from Europe as a result of their dispossession of, through this process of primitive accumulation to these other parts of the temperate belt all over the world. In the countries of the South, there is no place for people to go. There is no possibility of migration of people by the dispossession of, 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 of the people from their means of production, primarily peasants from their land. There's no place for them to go. All they can do is go into the already glutted cities of their own countries. And so there's no reason to think that all this grand idea that everybody would become one and all that would emerge as class and so on would ever happen in countries of the South. That was Gandhi's idea. He says that's the wrong way to think of how to achieve oneness. And, and so it was very important for him to, to see that this idea in Marx and this idea generally is not a bit of theory at all. It's a local observation about what happened in Europe because of the contingent empirical fact that people in Europe, because of the possibility of the mobility of labor at that time, to, to, to go to other parts of the world. It was, it's a totally contingent fact about Europe at a, partic at a particular time in a particular period of history. It's not a generalizable bit of theory. And, and so what we, we are stuck with is having to imagine different forms 
uh, oneness than what was presented by this idea in not just Marx, but of course, a whole range of, of other modernizing theorists. But what is interesting to us who broadly belong to the left, people like Mary and me, is that it is equally true of Marx. This, this wrong-headed idea. And that's why it's the, the, the kinds of things that Mary has directed our attention to, which is these indigenous ways of thinking and so on, become very important because the standard left way of thinking derived from classical accounts in Marx simply are not applicable to countries of the South. So, but before we, you know, Mary Louise will ask you to, to say a um, few words as well. But Akil, I wonder if I can ask you, maybe I missed it, but I, I feel like you didn't quite say what Gandhi's alternative conception of oneness was that he would present in contrast to this Western right. falsely universalized account. Yeah. You see, he, he, it's, it's really, it, this is a complicated thing. I'll try and say it very briefly. I think some one thing that Mary said is really seems to me to be exactly correct, and that is that when one thinks of the future, it's not always. I mean, I'm I'm putting it slightly differently, but I think it's of a piece with what she said. Gandhi's view was: when one thinks of the future, one shouldn't be making predictions. That is, one shouldn't take a detached view, a disengaged view, and say, this will happen. Uh, for just the sorts of, of difficulties that Mary passingly mentioned, what he thought was uh, let me let me let me present this to you by telling you an anecdote, which I may have told, uh, Benjamin, I may have told you and, and Shazab before, but maybe I haven't told Mary and people in this audience. See, let, let, let me get to, to this uh, sort of future and prediction with, with this anecdote. When I was a kid, I used to be taken for long walks by my father. And uh, one day when we were going for we were on a walk, we found a wallet with some money sticking out of it. And uh, and my father stopped me and he said, Akhil, why should we not take that? Uh, there's some, the, the wallet with some currency uh, uh, sticking out of it. And, and he said, why should we not take that? And I said, gosh, I think we should take it. And and he looked irritated and he said, well, why should we take it? And I said, what? It's a classic response. I said, if, if we don't take it, somebody else will take it. So let's take it. Um, and, and he looked cross, but then he suddenly, his face changed and he said, I said, we, if we don't take it, somebody else will take it. And he said, if, if we don't take it, nobody else will take it. Now, here's the thing. If you see what my father said as a prediction of what will happen, it will come off as naive optimism. Right? So, so the idea that Gandhi has is what, what's needed is just to say, let's see the world this way. Just to just take a stance, an exemplary stance, just that this is how we should see the world, right? So it's not a matter of predicting the future, but just seeing the world in an exemplary way. And, and then if it's exemplary, it will be, you know, it'll have its efficacies. Um, and, and I think something like that is, is really become essential to understanding the oneness that comes with cooperation. Because you see, the reason why standard um, game theoretic skepticism about cooperation 
right? Notions of rationality, since you were asking me about Gandhi's views of rationality, standard modes of rationality says, look, cooperation is doomed to tragedy. The very idea of a commons and cooperation is doomed to tragedy because people will think, what, what, what if I cooperated and others didn't? Right? It's a standard game theoretic notion of rationality, which it says it's not rational to cooperate because you don't know that if you cooperate, others will too. And this is true of, of climate change. I mean, you know, if I don't run my air conditioner all summer long, how do I know that somebody else won't do it and so on? So, you know, all of this is constantly at stake in the idea of, of, of cooperation. And we are always anxious. What if I cooperated and others didn't? And I think what Gandhi's view was is that's the wrong view of rationality. What we should be assuming is just taking a stance, not worrying, predicting that others may not do it and so on. Don't get into the stance of prediction. Just take the view that if you don't do it, nobody else will. Or if you cooperated, everybody else will. And if everybody takes that stance, we, we might get out of a crisis. And it's not a matter of prediction. So his understanding of the future and the notion of rationality as it, as it navigates that understanding is, I think, one of taking an exemplary stance rather than prediction. It's a quite different notion of rationality, and he thinks unalienated people will have this alternative notion of rationality. So Mary Louise, just to, to draw back to the original question, you're exploring how contact zones between different cultures, peoples, um, you know, localities can be generative of, uh, you know, a sh kind of shared emotion or desire, which you've called planetary longing. And how might this experience some of the ideas that emerge from it um, differ from other prevailing conceptions of the global or of the human or of oneness? Well, you know, uh... One of I have a question for Akhil later, but one of the interesting things about that idea, that concept of the contact zone, which first I first articulated it in 1991, it has in the 21st century taken on all kinds of new lives all over the planet, and so somehow or other, again, there it it has been called upon to address pressing problems. And um, that uh, people have, and of course, one one of the sites where they started a whole a contact zone research institute was in, of course, Seoul, Korea, because they're thinking about their conflict zone. Um, and and another was a group of scholars um, at the borders, trying to study from the borders where Czechoslovakia, Germany, and Poland meet, and trying to create a kind of study. Unit, heterogeneity and, and and connectedness or disconnectedness there, and so it it became a way. It, it's continued to be a way of of creating uh, spaces spaces for um, rethinking bounded objects, uh, whether it's states or species, and and a, a group of geographers created the notion of the interspecies contact zone, where they look at interactions between humans and non-humans and the zones uh, like beaches where that happens. So, and, or, um, so there's just been, it's very been very interesting to see how that a concept has acquired new vitality outside of the, the uh, paradigm of colonialism where, or, or an imperialism where I was first, first came to it. Um, and uh, it's now a much more uh, familiar uh, idea to people um, for all, all kinds of reasons that have to do with how the world changed in the 90s and the, and the 2000s. Um, but in terms of, a, I'm really, I'm very intrigued by what Akhil said. In terms of planetary longings, I mean, I think one of the planetary longings is the longing for this not to be happening, <laughs> the longing for capitalism not to have won everything, you know, the, and um, so I think there's the, the longing not to have to migrate. There's a whole, the, the Mixteco in Mexico created um, 
demanded the creation of a new human right, which was the right to know the right to not migrate, el derecho a no migrar. And they they had a whole uh, meeting in Mexico to to get this right recognized by the state. And of course, it's not an individual right. It's a, a, a the right of a collectivity to not have to lose part of its population into the migrant stream. So uh, there are there are all kinds of forms of agency generated by the these the planetary longing or the form of agency you're describing where I'm going to act I'm going to act in the world as I want the world to be and that's the agency I have to make the world as I want it to be and I can instruct my son also to do the same thing <laughs> um so uh but and um so so I, I, that's what I, that's sort of the state of the the contact zone conversation but the interspecies contact zone thing intrigued me some too, and this is sort of because this is where I'm thinking from. But um, I remember Bourdieu. I think it's in Facing Gaia. He says everything that exists is looking to reproduce its conditions of existence or to continue its conditions of existence. And this is something that um, that that operates again, across not just humans or not just living and animate or living species, but he argues across everything. And I find that a very interesting idea, way of a very interesting force to be able to think about. And I say force because I think a lot of when things get predictable and we can't talk anymore in terms of systems um, and, and statistics, we can talk about forces that are in play in the world. And you can think of a contact zone as a force field in which there are forces in play and you do not know what they're going to do, but you know that they have the possibility of acting if they're in, if they're in, in play, in the place. And um, so, uh, so I, I've, I found it very productive to think in terms of forces as well as in terms of longings, but it was Darwin who, who, talked about uh, who who first focused so heavily on life for life as a force that the constant force to adapt to reproduce to continue one's conditions of existence and that every species has it and and is driven by it and it's it's a characteristic of being of a being a living be, a living thing and um Elizabeth Gross, the philosopher I mentioned earlier, wrote a very fascinating book several years ago called The Nick of Time that is a re reinvention of, Dar of Darwin um, in the context of a kind of uh, contemporary femi feminist imagination. And she looks again at interdependence in this way that um, the tree that blooms in order to attract the particular insect that will pollinate it because it's been attracted to a different flower before. So that the whole way that that uh, the world organ living creatures shape themselves and devise themselves in order to perpetuate their conditions of replicate to of reproduction and, con and continuation is another kind of thing you could you could imagine in terms of planetary longing. And it's a force that you know, with climate change, it is it bursts out all the time in in unexpected ways. So, we see we've just seen now that um, coral and whales and um, all kinds of uh, sea creatures are moving north as the sea warms and finding new habitats there. They're just you know, and there are in in Canada we have a huge problem because there are all kinds of insects. That used to die off in the winter, so their numbers were controlled by the climate, and that isn't happening anymore. And so the the this thing called the uh, a pine beetle is destroying the boreal forests, it, it acres and acres by the hundreds and thousands of acres because we and it cannot possibly be controlled. But it's just doing what it's supposed to do, just the way the COVID virus did what it's supposed to do, and just kept replicating and mutating. That's its job. It's a virus. Um, so that all the the way that we're I've I've found it very interesting to become more aware of this the force of this replication because it's it's operating now in unpredicted 
ways and in new ways and creating new um, new realities that humans have to live in. And it's not just living creatures. I mean, I, there's an incredible book called, um, oh, it's about fire by J- James Bayon. Um, and it's about, uh, anyway, he, t- he does this huge analysis of fire. It's based on the huge fire in Fort McMurray in Northern Alberta in the oil patch. But he points out that fires are the same way. They seek fuel the way cre- living creatures seek food. They want to expand themselves. They they want it's like do they have a desire? They have do they have an in- intentionality? But they operate in that way. So you have to if you're thinking in this way, you you're not only thinking about animate creatures or or plants. Um so that's another domain of a planetarity, a planetary longing that I, I don't know what to do with it. I'm just, but I think it's really interesting to think with um, right now. But I, I wanted to ask a question to Akil that comes out of this a little bit about capitalism as a force. And, and in a way as a force, it's like fire. <laughs> do you, do you think that, and I don't know the answer to this question. Do you think that capitalism is still under human control or is it perpetuating itself through humans? You know what I mean? Um, well, it's a very, very uh, mm-hmm. important and, and central question, uh, Mary. M- m- my view is, and, and you know, this is, comes partly, I think, from reading uh Economists like Samir Amin, who I, I think is uh, very insightful on this, and others like Prabhat Patnaik in India and so on. See, my, my feeling is, is that capital does not tolerate constraints upon it for very long. Very long. The, it, I think it's in the nature of capital to not tolerate constraints, abiding constraints on it. See, that's why that's why social democracy is, is perpetually unstable. You elect a social democratic government, it, you, you topple it five years later, four years later. You know, it just happens, or even in Scandinavia, which happens to be in the peripheral belt of capital, but even there it gets undermined constantly. So, so... It's not in the nature of capital. I mean, capital is like a gust of wind. It just happens to be a social gust of wind. You know, it's not a physical, a natural gust of wind, but it's a it's a tendency. It's a drive, and uh, it, it's 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 not reasoned. It it's got it's it's a bunch of dispositions. The predispositions that come from capital or in capital, and and so one of the dispositions is to is to refuse constraints on itself which are abiding constraints so so i think the choice that that subjects within capitalism have is is i the only sense of freedom we therefore possess is is not the freedom of thinking well we can now permanently put constraints on capital because that's what it won't tolerate. So, so we have an alternative. You either try and put constraints on capital, which will be overturned, or this is a disjunction, or you try and transcend capital. The trouble is, and this this is, I suppose, it goes to the question that 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 uh, our hosts have asked us to think about imagination. I mean, Jameson was completely right. You know, Jameson, in this famous remark of his, when he said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capital. Right? Yes, exactly. Right? So it, it's absolutely true. We do not have what Raymond Williams calls the keywords by which to generate in the political, political zeitgeist a fundamental critique of capital. We just don't have it. I mean, a few professors might have it. Samira Amin sitting somewhere, you know, and one or two other people, professors here and there might have it. But the idea that it's going to be in the political zeitgeist is, I think, not something we've found 
any imaginative strategy to bring about that. We just don't have it. So then the fossil, because you see the fossil fuel industry participate, you know, setting, saying Exxon will say, we're going to, we're going to cut our production by 20% in, in 20, 2050. And then they just, they just don't, they just don't do what they say they're going to do. Now, no one's doing what they said they were going to do, but I'm, I'm, I, I, it's so it it's quite remarkable because it's the whole issue is around the fossil fuel fossil fuel and its use in the fossil fuel industry and it's it's supposedly run by humans who know who see before them but and yet you're right there's no there's no self constraint visible you know it, anyway I keep I'm sorry, go ahead, Akil. Uh, go ahead, and then we'll we'll go to the next question. I, I, I do want to let you respond. Well, we're almost but, out of time. Sorry. No, I was just saying we live in a world in which there's no electable political party further left of the poop. <laughs> and, oh and, and, and I think it, and I think the, the, the deepest ground for it is that we do not have a critical discourse. Which, which is, we, we just don't have the critical discourse to do it, right? As soon as such a discourse has even the glimmerings of, of appearance in the political culture, it's declared to be unelectable, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think liberalism has an enormous complicit role in this. Yes, uh, we have we have about 10 minutes left. And so I, I want to get in this last question, which I think actually indirectly relates to, to what you've been speaking about. Um, both of you have critiqued how the modern academy and its disciplines often uphold destructive mythologies that promote the fragmentation of knowledge and the division of humankind. In a, in a striking passage, for example, Mary Louise, you write that borders with others, and I'm quoting you directly now, have been policed and reproduced by modern academic disciplines institutionalized in the second half of the 19th century. Anthropology produces and enforces the category of the primitive, economics those of backwardness and underdevelopment, political science administers the distinction between state and non-state, simple and complex societies, philosophy the distinction between the rational and the irrational, literary studies and art history that between high culture and popular or vernacular culture. Similarly, Akhil, you've noted, um, and I think you've talked about it here today as well, that often a discipline discourages the development of frameworks outside a set of assumptions on which there is a, a mainstream consensus. So, you know, with, with about 10 minutes left, I'd, I'd love to ask you, how might the research university and our systems of knowledge be reimagined to promote the integration of knowledge, to promote the emergence of genuinely new ideas and assumptions, and, and ultimately to promote um, a conception of the oneness of humankind that is um, constructive and conducive to the well-being of, of humanity. Mary Louise, let's start with you. Okay, just, well, just a little question. Yeah, just a little question. I, I'll I'll be quick because I know we're out of time. First of all, I don't think affirming the oneness of humanity is the the uh, the um, desi- de- desideratum of the university. So it's something I uh, it's not, a, not an objective that I find particularly inspiring at the moment. But and before talking about the university at all, I think we need to acknowledge that at this very moment. Um, universities are, are under system, systematic attack from a right organized right wing that really uh, wants to undermine their educational mission and um, is and uh, undermine their mission as the home of critical thought, as the place for serious debate, a place where questioning happens, where critical citizens citizens are built. And and where the love of ideas and thinking uh, flourish, so that the the education position um, role of the university is under attack as part of the, the attack on democracy. So this is a moment in which we also need to be defending uh, defending the university and articulating its 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 what it does and its ideals and its values. Um, we have to help universities defend themselves 
And the other thing I want to say is that I've been in universities for now over 55 years, and I can't imagine a more thrilling and exhilarating time to be in universities than the time those those decades that Akhil and I have shared in the university. Um, every discipline had, in that period has experienced a kind of methodological and conceptual revolutions. Interdisciplinary spaces have blossomed in all over the place. Um, the work of democratizing uh, higher education has transformed knowledge making and it's been amazing. And there have been tremendous struggles around that. And um, like I say, for me, I'm, I have nothing but incredible gratitude for having been able to spend my life um, in, in this work. Uh, I think the big problem the universities have faced, one of their two, and one is the corporatization of universities, which began which began in the last 20 or so years with opening themselves up to corporate investment in research so that um, uh, in profit, so and, in, and, and the engagement of the universities in profit-oriented research funded by the, the corporations that were going to profit from it, and also that led to the personal enrichment of the researchers themselves. That whole, that whole paradigm, which I think started at Harvard in the medical school, if I'm not wrong, and then it was Berkeley's chemistry department kind of sold itself to a corporation. That has been very harmful in the universities. Um, and, um, and the other thing that's happened, of course, is that, and because of that, universities have started to re reshape themselves like corporations. So. When we started our careers, if you said, what is the university, anyone would tell you it's the faculty. And, and the administration's job was to work for the faculty and enable the faculty to do that they do. And that now universities administrations gradually became, started to operate more like corporate, <clears throat> corporate governances structures that self-perpetuated and expanded themselves and the university now, if you ask well, what is the university, the university is the administration and the faculty work for them, are their employees. And just to imagine a faculty member as an employee of a university, which is now very natural to us, was not thinkable when Akhil and I started our careers. It was not, it didn't look like that at all. Um, <clears throat> you'll correct me if you don't, if you, you don't agree. Um, so I those are those are very serious issues. At the same time, we can ask, you know, the long run question, can universities do more to produce the, the truly radical? Again, I'm thinking in terms of climate catastrophe. Can, can the universities do more to produce the truly radical changes in in the ways of life of of capitalist countries and fossil fuel based, especially fossil fuel fuel-based economies, can they do more to intercept the norms that sustain all of that? Um, and that's the question. And I, I do often wonder now whether the university is more part of the problem than part of the solution, simply because it's an institution that it gets, it gets caught up in its own self-replication. So the job of the economics department is to keep being an economics department. And if the French historian retires, he should be replaced by another French historian. So that self-replication whole is a kind of sort of form of entropy that does hold things back, and um, and and inhibits the the creativity that can flourish in interdisciplinary spaces. But those spaces are often much more institutionally fragile. Um, so I <clears throat> I do I do fear for I do. Uh, wish for the university to become more part more, more, more a space for more radical proposals uh that can and for making that getting and for engaging the public with more radical proposals and convincing people um of the scale of what is necessary um to in order to create the a, a sustainable livable future mm -hmm. so that's my two cents thank you yeah, I I agree, I agree with with Mary, and part of the result of of that kind of uh, corporate stranglehold is is just that uh, our knowledges have become professionalized, and I think that's been a a, a very sad development. I mean, I, I when I began doing philosophy, I was doing a subject. By some alchemy, it became a discipline, and and by some 
Further alchemy, it became a profession. People talk of the philosophy profession now, and that's how I'm supposed to think of my students as entering a profession. And I, and I think that, that that makes for a whole range of, of deformations in, in knowledge and in, in the pursuit of these subjects. Uh, you know, for instance, I, I, it, it's shocking that in an economics department, I once tried to study uh, the history of economic thought in an economics department, I couldn't find a course to take. Um, and and uh, I mean, as a faculty member, I just wanted, I, I felt I couldn't understand the world if I didn't know some macroeconomics and the history of economics, and, and I couldn't study it in an economics department. And I couldn't study, you can't study colonialism. The idea that you can understand the world as an political economy of the world without understanding colonialism I mean, it, you know, all of the political economists shaped by, and you can't study it in an economics department. It took a Palestinian literary critic to put imperialism on the map in, in a university campus, on university campuses. It just shows how deformed our, our universities are. And, and I think I have, to, I have to say that Mary's subject, which is literature and cultural studies, showed a kind of chivalry in bringing all the things that the social sciences had abdicated, uh, you know, uh, uh, the value-oriented aspects of their subjects, the historical-oriented aspects of their subjects, I think English and complete and other subjects did that. Now, philosophy didn't do it, uh, uh, no, but, didn't. but I think English and all did it. They picked up a slack created by these abdications of other disciplines, and, and I think Part of the trouble is that, that you can't do it in English with the kind of rigor and so on that's needed. You need this, what, what England, English and Complet have so chivalrously done has to now feed back into the social sciences. And I don't think that is happening yet, but, but I think that may be a very specific way of trying to, to reorient things so that we can maybe do better than we have in the last half century. That's very interesting, yeah, thanks. Well, Akil, Mary Louise, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I you know, speak for Charles out of myself and say it was an extremely stimulating and interesting exchange. Lots of new ideas uh, have emerged, uh, much to reflect on um, and think about for, for the future. Um, thank you so you know, much. We'd also like to yeah, we'd also like to thank our sponsors, the Institute of Public Knowledge at New York University, the Rock Ethics Institute at Penn State University, and the Center on Modernity in Transition. And of course, thanks to everyone in the audience who will be watching later as well for joining us. Um, we hope you'll join us again in two weeks on Friday, May 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern, when we'll be welcoming Kenneth Brown and Heinrich Pass to discuss uh, oneness and reality. Um, these are two... Um, uh, theoretical physicists, um, and, and I think it'll be a very stimulating conversation. So we hope to see you all then. Um, three weeks, Akio, actually, just three to, weeks, just, yeah. just in case, uh, yeah, people are are doing the wrong. I, I did the wrong math, apparently, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's three weeks, um, May tenth. So, Keila, Mary Louise, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. So nice to see you, Mary. See you. Same, same here, Akil. It's been a while. I love yeah. seeing you too. Be well. You too. Bye.